Welcome to the first session of Archaeology in the Bible. Before we can dive very deeply into the Bible as an archaeological artifact, we need to talk about general archaeology itself. So where does archaeology come from? Well, it comes from the Greek. We have the word archaeos, which means ancient, and you add to that the word logia, which means the study or history of, and you get the study of very old things. So our good friends at Wikipedia give us the definition of archaeology as the study of human activity through the recovery and analysis of material culture. Bear in mind that, uh, that phrase, human activity. We only really see what people do in, uh, in the leavings uh, that we find in archaeology. That really is uh, defined as material culture. Uh, David Kingery says that archaeology writes the history from things. And so really that material culture finds its way to us through mainly artifacts. And an artifact is going to be any object that was made or even modified by human culture and then is subsequently recovered by archaeology. So those artifacts can be any one of a number of things. They can be a work of art. It can be a common use item. It can be a monument or a tool or weapon. So what are some other aspects of material culture? Well, you also have architecture. And just as we have housing styles today, so also did the ancient world. So the arch architecture is going to vary in time and it's going to vary by region. We have some examples here of Greek architecture, uh, architecture in India, and uh, the Mayan culture architecture in Central America. Not just things that are made by man, we also will often find natural objects that'll be found side by side with the artifacts, but they'll still give us some context in terms of the archaeology, and those are biofacts and ecofacts. So biofacts are going to be organic in nature. So just some examples of biofacts, you have pollen, which is in many cases used to determine what region some something came from based on the sorts of uh, flowers that produce the, the pollen. We have seeds, which are a good indicator for the level of agriculture and even the diet that was in place in that particular region and time frame. Wood is a very, uh, very good biofact uh, for a number of different reasons, but uh, one that's, that's really interesting is that it can be used for dating and to give us an indication of the uh, type of climate. Uh, this is called dendrochronology and you can see the varying thicknesses of the rings of a, of a tree, and that will tell you how plentiful the, the water was, how, how difficult the, uh, the climate was. And archeologists have even had success in comparing other climatological uh, type records and comparing them to trees based on the thickness of those rings to actually uh, sync those up. Probably the most well-known biofact is going to be the bone, and those bones can be animal bones or, or human bones. Now, a good example of an ecofact, this is going to be really more of a naturally occurring non-organic. Uh, quite often, again, in terms of climate, uh, we will take uh, soil or core samples. Uh, sometimes they'll take ice samples in the Arctic that can give them uh, good examples or good indicators of what the, the climate and rainfall was uh, at various time frames. So we also have cultural landscape. Uh, man likes to modify his environment to suit his purposes. So we may say things like uh, terracene or irrigation ditches uh, or, or so forth. And here's an example of uh, that very thing of, of terracene. Uh, at a, a British fort, uh, you can see over the years uh, the, the degree to which the, the terracing has, has been done. So 
So let's reach back and look at the kind of the history of archaeology a, a bit. Uh, really, it starts off uh, with essentially treasure hunters and tomb robbers. Now, when I say archaeologist, the first thought in most of your minds was Indiana Jones. And uh, the, the professors of archaeology that I've, uh, that I've been studying with are quick to tell you that uh, their lives are not like uh, the life of Indiana Jones. Um, one of the professors you even mentioned, I don't have the hat or the whip. Uh, but really, most of the digging in the past and still a certain amount of it today was for personal gain. Uh, these, uh, these artifacts would have been sold uh, or at least displayed in private collections. Uh, and you have to be very careful with that even today. Uh, some of the digs even will have to post security so that people don't come after hours to try and recover uh, artifacts that are uh, in, in the process of being excavated. Uh, many nations, and among among the most strict would be those in the Middle East, have uh, have laws about the recovery of their of their antiquities. So we're not always looking for ancient civilizations. Sometimes we find things purely by accident. And uh, this example, I couldn't resist. Uh, this is the Nabonidus cylinder. Uh, Nabonidus was the last king of Babylon sometime in the general uh, 5, 500, 550 BC range. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about him in session six, but uh, he, uh, in the course of building a new temple, he discovered a foundation deposit, uh, a monument marker from Naram Sin, who was a king of Akkad about 1600 years before Nabonidus's time, and this kind of got him all jazzed up about archaeology. And so uh, this cylinder, this clay cylinder that is engraved with, uh, with cuneiform writing, is a document of his efforts at archaeology and the several digs that he made in the area of Babylon and the finds that he made. So just like Nabonidus, we have to ask ourselves, where are we going to dig? Uh, and really the, the, the first place to start is to consult the sources. Uh, quite often contemporary literature can, can tell, us, uh, tell us some things. Uh, those may be historical accounts, uh, thing, it, pieces of information from the time frame that we're, we're seeking. Uh, one notable thing that uh, scholars have found is when you look at these historical documents, they'll list out various cities in, in their records. And normally the order that the cities are listed in is the same order that you would uh, come to the city if you were traveling in a certain direction. So uh, archeologists have been able to look at these city lists and go in order and be able to tell which city is between uh, these other cities. Uh, in, in the order that, that you would encounter them when you're traveling. Now, also, we can have finds at other sites that can indicate where to dig. Uh, here's uh, an interesting uh, site, the Madaba map, uh, which is in Madaba, Jordan. It's a floor mosaic in a Greek Orthodox church. It's the Church of St. George. It is the oldest or earliest known map that represents the Middle East. It's been dated to about the middle 500s AD. And what's noteworthy is it shows several cities that are really unknown to modern scholars, and it shows them with their traditional ancient names. Now, this isn't an exact map, but it does give you a general representation of about where things are. Now, also you see here in the middle of the map, uh, circled in blue, is Jerusalem. Bear in mind still, it's a, uh, it's a church map, so Jerusalem is going to be very important. And another thing to be mindful of is that uh, this map, on this map, uh, north is not up, east is up, uh, because east is where the sun rises. And so you can see uh, there, uh, just above Jerusalem, you see the Dead Sea. So also in consulting the sources, uh, 
we find uh, the value of tradition. Now, many scholars will dismiss the historical accuracy of traditions, but what you're going to find as we go through this course, uh, be very conscious about being dismissive of of tradition and uh, and things like that because you can quite often find yourself um, going back on that and eating a bit of crow. Uh, for over 2,000 years, people have been reading about Troy in Homer's Iliad, but pretty much every scholar would tell you that the underpinnings of that story were just just as mythical as the gods and goddesses that are that are mentioned in the story as well. But in 1860, uh, had some excavations began at Hisserlik, Turkey, by Heinrich Schliemann and others, and they continued those uh, excavations for about 30 years. But uh, eventually, they found that uh, this site was ancient Troy. There was evidence of destruction by Mycenaeans, who were the ancestors of the ancient Greeks, and that destruction was in about the right general time frame. So now you find that most scholars will accept that uh, this site in Hyserlik is actually the Troy of Homer. Also, you can do the site surveys. You, you want to look at the landscape and, and see, and how, how does that help you decide where to dig? Well, sometimes you find artifacts in the area. Uh, often uh, something will expose the artifacts and bring them near the surface. That can be agriculture, that can be construction. But once you start to find um, this evidence of artifacts, that's a pretty good indication that, that it's a place you might want to dig. Uh, also, we have the topography. Uh, not just the lay of the land, although that can also be important, uh, but also the vegetation patterns can indicate what's underneath in areas where there's a lot of uh, stone uh, stone construction that's underneath the underneath the ground you'll find that the plants uh, don't necessarily grow as well directly over that spot uh, so that can be a, a, a nice indicator now since I'm a technology guy I have to jump into into this one sometimes you can see the uh, see what's going on underneath the surface with technology that's that's called geophysics uh, this specific example we have is a magnetometry shot of a field near Brighton in England, and this is believed to be a Roman era farm. Now, the magnetometry is going to pick up the differences in the magnetic field of the soil, and that uh, that magnetic field will be disturbed or be changed if you have uh, things inside the soil, either disturbances or inclusions within it, and that can be ditches, that can be stones, various things. Uh, and while it's a really neat uh, neat process, it can be very difficult to interpret the results. Sometimes you can have naturally occurring features that look uh, just like something that's man-made, and uh, quite often geophysics is very expensive uh, to perform. And you'll find that many archaeological digs are done by uh, by educational institutions, and they are funded on a shoestring. So geophysics is, is not a, a common thing that, uh, that you necessarily get to use. So with all these other things, in many cases, it just really comes down to educated guesswork. Uh, a good location is a good location. If it's a place you would have built a city, then probably somebody built a city there, and so it's a good place to dig. Uh, you look at those in terms of likely loca locations. Uh, one of my professors uh, told a story about uh, they were looking for a, a pottery manufacturing facility or a, a large scale pottery shop uh, at Tel El Hammam in Jordan. And uh, they weren't having any luck finding it. And they started asking themselves, OK, well, where do you put a pottery uh, manufacturing area? And Well, it's got to be near near water. So you start looking near the river, but then the, the part that kind of put them over the top was, well, if you're going to be baking or firing uh, clay pots all the time, there's going to be a lot of smoke. So what's the, uh, what's the prevailing wind? And let's look where in areas that would be downwind of the palace and where the wealthy people live, because, of course, they wouldn't stand for having that smoke uh, blowing through their area. And lo and behold, there they found 
the pottery manufacturing uh, facility. So uh, there's something to be said for, for all that sort of uh, educated guesswork. Now, once the guesswork is done, uh, it's time to pick up your trowel and start to dig. So you've studied the situation and here you go. But you have to be in, bear in mind, and this is something that, that kind of surprised me uh, when I first started studying archeology, span uh, it is a destructive science. Uh, once you dig something out, you can't put it back. So uh, you look at uh, just the, the degree of disturbance uh, that an excavation produces. Um, artifacts can be damaged or lost during the excavation process. And you're starting to see more and more now uh, the use of sifting where uh, the dirt from the excavation is put through a sifter. And in many cases, they will find small artifacts that were missed during the, during the manual digging. Also artifacts uh, can deteriorate specifically uh, organics like wood and, and bone, uh, they can deteriorate very quickly when exposed to the atmosphere after, after having been uh, in the soil for so long. And finally, improper excavation, if you, if you have poor technique, you can sometimes come to some, some bad conclusions or incorrect conclusions. So you have to be very conscious and, and aware of that sort of thing as well. So how do you approach excavation then with, uh, with, with the mindset that it is a destructive science? Well, there's a few different ways to go after it. Uh, one of those is the architectural method. Uh, in the architectural method, you'll find that uh, there's a great emphasis on buildings and structures, on the foundations of, of those buildings. And you really are looking to, to see the full extent of them. You're, you're trying to to track them all the way through and to see what relationship one building might have to another. And so what that leads to, as you can see here in the picture, is a widespread removal of soil so that you can expose the walls and the foundations over a broad, wide uh, distance. However, this sometimes loses uh, some of the detail that you might ordinarily get. Uh, which leads us to uh, another method called the Wheeler Canyon method. Uh, can also be called the British method or the Earth Layers method. And what this looks like is it's a very organized uh, digging methodology. Uh, you have surveyed squares. Normally they're about six meters by six meters. And of that, of that you will excavate about five, five meters by five meters and you'll leave a meter around two of the two of the edges and those are called bulks they're kind of dividers between the squares uh, what that bulk really allows you to do is you can see the progressive layers of soil uh, as you uh, as you excavate down and again wheeler canyon is going to be very methodical you're it's essentially like draining a bathtub you're gonna you're gonna dig an entire layer out you're gonna dig a few inches out all the way across from bulk to bulk and and look at it you're going to dig a, a you know a few more inches out and you're going to look at it and so forth and so on but this does allow you to look at those progressive layers of soil and those those layers are called strata and let's look at uh, at strata or stratigraphy because that's a, a very key aspect to archaeology the mindset or the theory is that as soil is deposited as uh, as time goes by then the things that are, in, that are in the bottom layers are older than things that are in the, the layers above. Uh, and so you use this as a, a means to uh, really determine the relationship between the various artifacts that you find. Now, as is the case with many things in life, quite often the best way is, uh, is to mash those two together into a bit of a hybrid method which kind of gives you the best of both worlds and uh, a lot more flexibility. So let's talk a little bit more about stratigraphy and specifically to a concept that is very common and, uh, and really a key and a foundational aspect to archeology span in the ancient Near East. And that is the, uh, the BDA process, the building destruction and abandonment pro process. Now I've, uh, I've prepared a little graphic here uh, to, uh, to talk through uh, BDA. Uh, first, 
we look at this and we see that uh, in the ancient Near East, uh, mud bricks were the most commonly used building material of the time. So you might have stone foundations, but you would build your the, the structure of your, your home, the walls, with mud bricks. And so you move along and you're, you're living your life and then something bad happens, uh, some sort of destruction event, the D in the BDA. Uh, and that bad thing could be war, it could be famine, it could be disease. Whatever it is, people leave or people die. And so the area no longer has human habitation. Uh, that brings us to the A portion, abandonment. Uh, mud bricks really require a lot of upkeep. The, the weather will, will cause them to break down and deteriorate. Even within a few years, uh, you know, uh, an entire city can, can break down significantly. And so those bricks will deteriorate and eventually they'll cover the entire area such that you might not even recognize that it was inhabited before. Now, favorable ground being favorable ground, it's normally, it's gonna be high, it's gonna be defensible, it's gonna be close to a water source. There's gonna be farmland around it. So if somebody wanted it before, somebody's gonna want it again. And so they'll come along and they will build on top of it. And then you see that eventually something bad happens to them. They abandon the area and we're right back to uh, the, the, uh, the deterioration of the mud bricks. Uh, and then over the years, you're going to see it becomes wash, rinse, and repeat uh, with the, the building, the destruction, the abandonment. And eventually we come to essentially the modern day. So that really ties in with uh, with what's called the tell. All over the Near East, we have these localized hills that are called tells. Now, in um, in Arabic, it's uh, T E L L tell. Uh, the the Jordanians actually pronounce it tell, but spell it T A L L. Uh, and then in Hebrew, also the the Israelis will call it tell with only one L. Uh, no matter which spelling, uh, tell means mound in both Arabic and Hebrew. And for a long time, people thought that these were just some sort of naturally occurring hills uh, just out on these plains. However, in the late 1800s, Sir William Flinders Petrie uh, began to excavate uh, a tell in, in Canaan. And by 1894, he had written a book called A Mound of Many Cities. And he came to this conclusion of the book by seeing what we have here in the graphic, which he saw layer after layer of different time frames where, uh, where different societies had built one on top of the other. And so this really was the birth of, um, well, it was really the birth of modern archaeology, but uh, the concepts of stratigraphy and uh, building uh, uh, destruction and abandonment, all of those kind of things uh, really came from uh, from Petrie's uh, book, A Mound of Many Cities. So really with all these layers, soil analysis becomes very much more important. And the soil is generally going to be different between those layers, between those strata, and that's gonna help you to uh, to determine the, uh, the, the division points between, between your various strata and your various time frames. Now, we have to be uh, conscious, though, that uh, the strata are not going to be nice and straight. They are going to vary. And then also, we need to be aware of the fact that uh, they're not nice and continuous. Quite often, uh, something will disturb the strata. It can be a natural phenomenon, but in many cases, man will disturb the strata. The, for some reason or another, they feel the need to dig deep, either for construction or a well or something like that. And you can find that uh, a later strata will disturb a previous strata and kind of grow into it. Uh, it's, uh, you hear stories of finding the 1957 quarter in a Middle Bronze Age uh, refuse pit, uh, all because someone was digging a well in, in that area. So uh, again, uh, you have to be very conscious of the context that, that you make your finds in. 
Now again, uh, looking at uh, the, the soil analysis aspect, we have here the Munsell color chart for soil uh, that was originally developed by an art professor named Munsell. It uh, is a, a means where you can uh, look at your soil layer and give it a numeric code uh, for, for its coloration. And you have to be quick in that documentation uh, because the, uh, the soil color is going to change as it starts to dry out after excavation. So you want to hit it uh, as, as quickly as you can uh, in the excavation process. And the value in having that Munsell color numbering sequence is that uh, if I'm excavating on one side of a site and then I have an excavation way on the other side, you know, several hundred meters away, I might uh, be able to match up my strata purely based on the soil coloration. So speaking of soil, let's talk about something that's made from soil. So we have the role of pottery in the ancient world. Now, uh, to quote one of my professors, ceramic pottery was the plastic of the ancient world. And just as plastic is today, pottery was often considered generally disposable. It was cheap. Uh, there was a lot of it around uh, and it had a wide variety of uses. And those uses range to anything from cooking. And here we have a late Bronze Age cooking pot. Uh, it could be serving ware. Uh, this is a Middle Bronze Age bowl. Uh, it could be used for storage. And this is a wine amphora. Uh, actually, this was recovered underwater from a, a sunken ship. And even other types of uses, uh, this example here is, is a lamp. So what's the value of that? Well, we archeologists love to categorize things because then they can start to, uh, to use them as parts of their study. So how do you categorize pottery? Or uh, to use the technical terminology, uh, how do you work through the ceramic typology? Uh, well, you can look at the pots uh, or at the pottery and you can look at what its function is. You can look at its form uh, and those two usually will go together, but uh, there can still be variations in, uh, in the form, uh, even within function. And uh, most, uh, most variable of all would be the decoration. Uh, and this really gives you a good way to distinguish between various pottery types. And then when you look within some of the types, you can see levels of variation as well. So you have these various uh, pottery uh, types that all essentially do the same thing, but you can see there's a wide range of shapes and uh, features and sometimes decorations, whatnot. Um, and so this, uh, this allows us to make some, some key distinctions in there. So how does that uh, tie in with archeology? span Well, a few advantages of pottery and archeology. span One, it's durable. Now you may break the pot, but the clay itself is gonna be very stable and it will last thousands of years, especially if it's been fired in a kiln. So uh, we find lots and lots of pottery in archeological digs in the ancient Near East. Also, that typology is very, very valuable, very important uh, for dating, uh, dating a site. Uh, just, like, just like we have fashions in clothes and in cars and various other uh, items in our day-to-day -day life, pottery was the same way. It also showed uh, trends and fashions and there might be technological improvements and so forth. And you can see how pottery develops over the years and how these, these fashions run through. And if you can ever figure out which ones were before which other ones, uh, you can use this, uh, this type of, uh, or this typology uh, to help you date the general time frame uh, of, of a site. Now again, uh, driving, it, uh, driving it into the uh, into the, the science aspect, um, we look at uh, thermoluminescence, uh, which is a neutron activation method, and it's going to tell us 
how long ago the clay was exposed to a very high heat source. And now that high heat source could have been when it was when it was fired in the kiln, when it was being made, or uh, if uh, if it was uh, recovered as part of the destruction event of say a fire, uh, it will give you a date for when uh, when that uh, clay pot was exposed uh, to to the fire. In all of these cases, you're really trying to date your find as closely as you can so that you can understand its context. You can understand the, the time frame and, and how it relates to everything around it. So ideally speaking, it would be great to find something that gives you an exact date and inscriptions and other datable artifacts. Wouldn't it be great to find a, a date book or something like that? Uh, unfortunately, most inscriptions with a date uh, well, they're uncommon, and normally when you get a date, it's a relative date. It will say in the third year of so-and-so's reign. And so if you don't know when so-and-so's reign was, you're still not uh, not very well off. Uh, but it can give you at least some, some indicators there. Now, another datable find is the Egyptian scarab. These are very uh, popular. People love to find these at the dig sites. Uh, because normally they're going to be marked with the cartouche or the symbol of the pharaoh at the time it was made. And we have a, a decent idea of the time frames of the Egyptian pharaohs. So that can put you in the, in, in the, uh, in, in a general time frame of, of when this scarab would have, uh, would have found its way there. Now, where you have to be conscious and careful these things were not only uh, prized and valued uh, by archaeologists; they were also uh, they were also prized and, and valued by the people of the time. And so, these things could have been in people's families for 20, 50, 100 years or longer. They could have been heirlooms. And so, just because you find something at a certain point doesn't mean that it wasn't already 100 or 200 years old. So, again, you have to be very mindful of the context of your site. Now again, typology, we talked about that, ceramic typology, uh, how that helps us to data find. The same can be true of architecture, um, but we can also draw those same kind of conclusions from the tools and the weapons, uh, specifically uh, the material they're, they're made from. You, you've all heard the term Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, those, that, is, that is exactly that, uh, that aspect of classifying a society based on the uh, the materials that they they use to make their tools and weapons now as an example we have here uh, an egyptian kopesh and a, and a babylonian thrusting sword now both of them are made from bronze but you can see very different forms from very different cultures and so if you're in canaan and you find a kopesh chances are there was probably a, a an egyptian military presence there uh, likewise with the, with the Babylonian thrusting sword. Sometimes the writing is what helps us out in terms of, of dating uh, the, the artifacts. Uh, we have uh, paleography, which is the study of, uh, of the, the ancient writing. And uh, really you have here uh, several different examples of lettering styles of ancient Greek. And those different lettering styles would have been prevalent at different time frames. And so if you're able to, to narrow it down to those time frames, then the, the lettering style of a document or of an inscription may be able to give you a range of dates when that inscription was actually made. Now, really diving into the, into the, the science here, we have uh, isotope analysis. Now, usually this is only going to be useful for organic materials. We have a couple of different types of isotopes. We have the unsta unstable isotope. And an unstable isotope is going to be something that's radioactive. And eventually, it's going to decay down into a non-radioactive form over time. The most, uh, the most popular or most well-known of these is carbon-14. Uh, carbon-14 is a radioactive isotope that occurs in the atmosphere, 
and all living things will take this carbon-14 into their bodies through respiration. They will breathe it in. And so as they, as they continue to breathe it in, they continuously, uh, they continuously will add carbon-14 into their, into their bodies. They'll replenish it. But uh, once, once the organism dies, once it starts, stops breathing, it stops taking in that isotope, then we know that there's a certain rate of decay of the carbon-14 into the more stable, uh, into the more stable forms of carbon, and we know about how long that takes. So you can start to make a, a determination of how long ago something died. Now this is going to assume that the levels of atmospheric carbon are relatively consistent over over time, and for the most part they seem to be. But there, there's still some discussion of that. Uh, other things that could impact carbon, such as uh, burning or or other types of things that could affect the the level of carbon in a, in a body, uh, also can throw this uh, throw this kind of analysis off. Uh, we also have to be careful, just like uh, we mentioned with the scarab, have to be careful of what's called an old life specimen. Uh, for example, if if I'm excavating a uh, a building and I find a piece of timber. Uh, and I date it to a certain time frame. It doesn't automatically mean that is the time frame of the building because wood was very, uh, very scarce in the ancient Near East and it was very prized. So uh, you might repurpose the wood. Uh, that piece of wood could be over 100 years old, could be 200 years old. So uh, you can't just blindly follow that in terms of, of the dating. Now we also have stable isotopes which don't decay over time. Uh, ordinarily, you'll find those are going to be taken into whatever the organism is, be that an animal or a, a person. Uh, it's going to be taken in through its diet. Uh, so, uh, for example, strontium, the strontium isotope, uh, is normally occurring in the soil and will be taken in by plants. Uh, in various degrees. Uh, the oxygen isotopes normally come from the drinking water that, uh, that an organism uh, drinks. Uh, so what you find is the strontium uh, percentages in the soil in Israel are different than the strontium levels in the soil in Egypt. And the, strontium, and the oxygen levels in the Nile are different than the oxygen levels in the Jordan. Uh, so uh, a an organism, a, an animal or a person who have uh, who've been drinking water and eating uh, food grown in a particular area, those isotopes are going to be present. Uh, normally, uh, the, the, the easiest place to find them quite often is in the tooth enamel, uh, but uh, they're going to be present in the percentages of the, uh, the area that, that they came from. Um, at some point, I, I certainly won't go into the detail here, but uh, if someone's interested, uh, definitely uh, ask me about uh, uh, the uh, the donkey uh, the the donkey lecture in one of our in one of our classes about uh, tracking donkeys between Egypt and Israel just based on the uh, the tooth enamel. Uh, it was it was absolutely fascinating stuff from my perspective. Anyway, uh, my wife didn't think so. So let me leave you with this. Uh, archaeology is the search for fact, not truth. If it's truth you're interested in, Dr. Tyree's philosophy class is right down the hall. Now, who would say such a thing? Our own Dr. Henry Indiana Jones. So this is true on the surface, but let's bear in mind that facts can lead us to the truth, and facts and truth don't have to be separate. In fact, they should really be inseparable. And so uh, in the next session, we're going to, to start looking at, uh, at the Bible from an, uh, from an overall archeological uh, perspective. Uh, so if you have more interest uh, in this general topic, I would recommend uh, Archeology span of the Land of the Bible. 10,000 to 586 BCE by Amahai Mazar. Uh, he has a, a very nice treatment of, uh, of general excavation techniques and the, the peculiarities of those techniques to uh, basically Israel and the ancient Near East. 
a a more general uh, a more general reference for field archaeology is the complete manual of field archaeology by Martha Jarkowski. Uh, that's basically the 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 core text for most archaeology programs. It is uh, it's very uh, <laughs> well it's dry, but it is full of information. If you just wanted to know something about how to uh, how to dig something or how to uh, recover an artifact without breaking it, that sort of thing. There's a lot of that, that kind of information in there. So I appreciate you uh, uh, coming out for, for this session and uh, hope to see you in the next.